Hello and welcome to the China Study Diet. My name is Chris and I'm here to help you understand the book, The China Study. Now it doesn't matter if you've read the book or not, okay? We're here and we're gonna go through and get the main highlights from the book. And if you've never heard of it, cool, that's also fine. It is, it is known as the most comprehensive book on nutrition science out there. That's what it's called. That's what they, people refer to it as. Um, and we're going to look at that. We're going to look at some of the science that's in the book from T. Colin Campbell, as well as uh, science that some of the other doctors and research papers in there are supporting about positive ways to eat and positive ways to use food as medicine. And I want to say that, like, this is our starting point, like in our journey in understanding food. I don't want to say, I'm, I'm not coming from a place with an agenda to say, this is the only way to do it. I don't believe that's true. But I do think that this is a good first step into understanding food science and food as medicine. And so from here, after this video, I would recommend, I, I, would, com I would compel you to go out and read uh, the opposing viewpoints. Go out and see um, you know, the criticism. Go out and look at paleo. Go look at other diets. But I do think that this is a good place to start so that we can have that conversation. I want to have that conversation with you, so I will follow up with some, some extra videos uh, and blog posts out there so that we can understand it. So this is our starting point, the China study. So that's where we are. We're doing this so that we could understand food better and hopefully build better habits in our life. So welcome and enjoy, because here we go. I ask the question, why, a lot. I ask the question, why, because, well, there's a lot of information coming at you and me all the time, right? I'm like the news and like from friends, and it's really hard to, it's like, but why? Why do we do the things we do? And so that's what I want to answer with food. Why do we eat the certain types of food that we eat and how does it affect our body? Because it's one thing for me to tell you or to be told, hey, Chris, don't eat sugar. Sugar is bad for you, but why? You know, if I have a substantial reason, I'll be able to apply it more to my decisions that I make every day. And let's talk about decisions because every time you make a decision, your brain has to work a lot. We want to build, or I, in my life, I want to build habits because if I know the right things and I do them once and I set good habits, it makes less decisions. It makes less anxiety. It makes less choices. And then I can live more free and just do whatever, do whatever I want to do, right? And so that's the place I wanted to be with food. And that's what brought me to the China study. I'd been reading about nutrition and nutrition science for 10 years. And it wasn't until the China study that it, it really took a holistic view of the information out there and kind of framed it in a way that I felt I had the whole story. From my life, the food science here just helps me make better decisions. So that if I feel, hey, you know, I want to eat healthy today, that I'm actually eating healthy and I'm not eating based on some non-facts that people are just spewing around, this has helped me make better choices. So when I do eat healthy, I'm eating healthy. And otherwise, I can live my life and do whatever I want. I mean, I love vegetables. I love spinach, avocado, and fruits like blueberries and bananas. But I also love tacos and I like to drink Tecate with a lime on the weekend. So, there's no right or wrong, but knowing, knowing the whys helps me choose and helps me have a more holistic diet. So that's where I'm coming from. Just a bit more about me just to get it started. So Chris Castiglione, I'm the co-founder of a company called One Month. We're an online education company. We like to say we get you smarter faster. And some of the challenges I've been working with teaching at One Month have been computer programming and trying to explain computer programming in a way that can apply to everybody. And that has been, over the past four years, a really a really difficult task to take that and explain that to heads of people at Amex or I, I taught it at Columbia University um, to write about it and to really break down that story so that we all can benefit from that. Um, this, for me, the challenge of explaining nutrition, it seems fairly parallel in that there's so much data and misinformation and good information, and it's just telling that story. And so I'm an educator, and that's why I'm here, to, to bring this story to you and help you understand it so that you can apply it and make sense to your life. Okay, so if I only had one minute to explain the China study to someone, here's my elevator pitch. In short, the China study is the most comprehensive study on nutrition ever conducted. So what we're looking at here is research on 6,500 people conducted over 20 years of time. It's a lot of data. It's a lot of data on nutrition and specifically protein. 
So we're going to talk a lot about protein. I think it's important because protein is this word that I hear all over um, through my friends, through my parents, all over. You read about it and it's like, where do you get your protein? You know, you need protein to go to the gym, protein, protein. Um, and it's a word that we've in the culture misused and abused. And that's where T. Colin Campbell comes in to really break down what he calls faddish diets, um, you know, diets that are just based on, hey, I lost weight overnight, per, you know, this must be good for me. Th what about long term, right? How is that affecting your liver? Or how is that affecting holistically your health? You know, weight loss is only one factor of that. Does that make sense? So that's, that's the idea, looking holistically at how protein affects our body. And when I talk about protein, or when T. Colin Campbell talks about protein, I don't just mean protein in meat or milk, although it is that, but it's also protein in fish, protein in eggs, protein in bread and grains, protein in vegetables. So it's going to be all different types of protein. And we're going to look at how the different types of protein affect your body holistically. So when the author, T. Colin Campbell, was asked, hey, how do you explain the China study in one sentence? Here's what he said. He said, OK, so what you're going to want to do is eat a whole food plant-based diet so mostly plants, while minimizing the consumption of refined foods, added salt, and added fats. Pretty good, right? Pretty concise. Let me break that down for you into three steps so that we can get the best out of that. So what he means is, number one, eat plants. Specifically, eat the rainbow. All the different colors is going to benefit you, and you'll get lots of nutrition. So eating colors that are green, tomatoes that are red, everything, uh, the more of it's going to be the mo most nutritious. Number two is eat less animal protein. So that's going to be milk, fish, eggs, meat, anything with, that comes from an animal. And number three is avoid processed foods. So less sugar, starchy carbohydrates, and vitamin supplements. So what you want to think of in general is getting to the core of food coming from the earth. The closer you get to the raw, uh, organic, normal food coming from the earth, right? As Michael Pollan, he talks about, you know, eat the broccoli. You know, what's the ingredient in broccoli? It's broccoli. Getting as close to that. Once we take that broccoli and we spray it with chemicals or we cook it, we ship it across the United States and we process it into a, a broccoli powder drink, which sounds disgusting, by the way. But you get the point. Once we refine that, at every step you're losing that nutrient. So we want to get as close to, as possible to that nutrient. And that's the overlying uh, or the underlying story, actually, of what's going on here. So hopefully that makes sense. All right, so stick with me. We're going to ask why to each of these points as we go forward. And the first why is going to be, why did he write this book, and why is it called The China Study? And it's a fascinating story about an emperor in the 70s who was dying of cancer and commissioned the study for the whole country. So check this out. It's a super interesting story. So why is it called the China study? Well, it all begins with this guy in the 1970s. He's the premier of China, which is basically like the prime minister, and he's dying of cancer. And so as he's there on his deathbed, he says, you know, wait, I don't know a lot about this disease that's taking my life, but it's horrible. And I don't want anyone else to have to suffer from this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to survey everybody. I'm going to have everybody give me some samples, and we're going to figure out more about this disease. Because in the 1970s, there wasn't as much information as there is now. So he puts out this survey to everyone in China. And this is what happens. 880 million Chinese people join in. That's how many people were in his survey. And that's just to give you some perspective. That's basically like 96% of the Chinese population at the time. It's a lot of people. OK. So what became of all that data? Well, it got published. It got published in this book here, The Atlas of Cancer Mortality in the People's Republic of China. This is a book, a book of maps, right? That's what an atlas is, and obviously. And uh, what it is is it's different maps looking at the highs and low rates of cancer within the country. And so now I want you to take a look at this map here and see if you notice anything kind of funny, right? I'll give you some hints. The, the red is very high levels of cancer, whereas the greens and the yellows are low levels, right? It's kind of crazy, right? There's this area that has all of this concentrated high risk of cancer. OK, so now you might be thinking, well, how high, you know, how high and low? What is the difference? So this is where things get pretty crazy. We're looking at counties in China. So the counties there with the highest rates 
were 100 times greater than the counties with the lowest rates of cancer. We're talking about 100 times. So how do, what does that mean? How do we feel that, right? Well, to put it into perspective, let's look at Long Island, right? Right outside New York City, Long Island. There was a case where two counties in Long Island, this is a true story, had breast cancer rates of only 10 to 20% higher than the state average. So we have a place in Long Island and it's just 10 to 20% higher. And this was enough to make the front page news, scare the hell out of people, and bring politicians to action, right? It was a big deal, just having 10 to 20%. So we're talking about 100 times the cancer rate, a big difference. That's basically like uh, me here in New York City being told that being in New York City, I'm going to have 10,000 percent higher chance of getting cancer. Uh, hypothetically, that's not true. But hypothetically, if someone told me that, I would be like, yo, I'm going back to New Jersey because this is crazy, right? That is an astonishing figure. And that's the level of change of difference of contrast that we're talking about right so you should be shocked right now because that's eye-opening why 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 we need to know why we need to know more and that's where t colin campbell comes in he's the author of the china study right and he comes in and he notices this in the late 70s and he's like whoa somebody has to look at all this data because we just have maps and we have data points but somebody has to go and really examine this and figure out why. So he spends 20 years with a team of people investigating this, diving into this, doing all kinds of contextual research around um, the people in China. Fast forward to this book that we're here talking about now in 2006 getting released. So how does cancer grow? The answer, like a seed. So follow me here through this analogy. We have three steps of cancer growth. There's the seed stage, the growing stage, and out of control when it's all over the place and can't be reversed. So let's check this out. Stage number one, initiation. This is like seeds entering your body. The seeds are carcinogens. You've probably heard that word before, carcinogens, right? So these carcinogens, you can think of them as like little evil seeds that get into your body. And where do they come from? Well, they come from everyday household chemicals. They come from the food, um, the air, the water around us. So it's in this initiation stage that these seeds get into our body and they germinate and they start to sprout, right? So I'm going to read from the book here. It's in this initiation stage. This is the time required for the chemical carcinogen to be consumed, absorbed into the blood, transported into the cells, and changed into its active product, which gets bonded with the DNA and passed into daughter cells. So this is when it's, it's blooming, we can say. When the new daughter cells are formed, the process is complete. So that's the stage of initiation. I'll also add that this stage happens very in a small amount of time. So from the book, page 49, in a short period of time, even minutes. Got it? So that brings us to step number two, promotion. It's in promotion that the seeds begin to grow. So just like seeds in the soil, the initial cancer cells will not grow and multiply unless the right conditions are met. So think about this, you know, what kind of conditions need to be met for seeds in the soil to grow? Well, you might be thinking, well, obviously they need sunlight, right? And they need water. They need these certain conditions. And that's what he's talking about here on page 50. And now if given the right conditions, what happens? Well, the seed grows and grows and grows and it can grow humongous, right? And this is the same analogy for cancer because when that seed continues to grow, it's going to grow out of control. And this is the third stage, progression. This is when that little seed's sprouted, grown, and it's just, and this is typically when we discover we have cancer. This is what we consider as cancers when we get to this stage. So at this point, prevention is over. It's time to treat the cancer with a prescription or therapy. So as it says on page 50, progression, it is like the fully grown lawn invading everything around it, the garden, the driveway, and sidewalk. So what we've learned is that there's three stages of cancer growth, initiation, promotion, and progression. And the one thing that's really important to understand is that of these three stages, the first and the second stage, as we'll find, are preventable. But it's that third stage that will kill you. And that's where we want to not get to. All right, so now we're at the experiments. And this is going to be the most data-rich part of the book. If you haven't read the book already, this is going to be an overview so that you can understand what people are talking to when they say the China study. They're, they're generally referring to this data part that T. Colin Campbell put together, which is actually part of 
the China Project. Now, the China Project is all the data and research, and the China Study is the book that is sharing that information with you. Get it? So that's the book. It's kind of the easy reader version of all the data. This part here is focusing on that data, and I'm going to try to bring it to you in a way that's more digestible. There's going to be five, and I'm going to go through the first three fairly quickly because it's the fourth and fifth that there's really some significant findings that are exciting. So let's get started with experiment one. The question in experiment one is, does protein intake affect cancer initiation? So remember, initiation is that first step, right, when the seed enters and is in the body. So the question is, does protein intake affect? When we're talking about protein, T. Colin Campbell is testing casein. And casein is the protein in milk. Okay? So here's a chart. And whoa, you look at this and it, yeah, what's going on here? I'm going to try to explain it best I can. So on the left, you'll see we have a lot of protein, 20%. That's considered a lot. Versus on the right, we have 5%. So the question here is, if we have a lot of protein, which I'm represented by this glass of milk, right, because it's casein, a protein in milk, if we have a lot of protein, how does that affect the initiation versus a little bit? And you'll see here on the left, enzyme activity, that's how, that's kind of one of the ways that we can tell the activity of initiation. So it's a little bit over my head as far as the science goes, but there's a, there's a pretty good explanation as to how this happens on page 49. And you can see here the way the aflatoxin, the, the poison, right, uh, the, or the toxicity, enters the body is that seed, and it's the enzyme activity that converts that toxicity to what we have here as um, the initiation stage leading to cancer, okay? Back to the graph here. So you can see enzyme activity, if that's how we're rating the first stage of cancer, you can see that with a lot of protein, you get a lot more activity. And with a little bit of protein, you get less activity. That's the main takeaway. Hmm, okay, interesting, right? You'll read in the book that, uh, that T. Colin Campbell says, it was almost like he could switch it on and off. By adding more, there would be more activity, and by switching it off, there would be less. Okay, so now we know that protein affects that first stage. He writes, enzyme activity could easily be modified by simply changing the levels of protein intake. That's what he's referring to with that on and off switch. So then the next question, okay, if that seed is, is uh, metabolizing, what about the second part? What about the promotion? Once it starts, does it continue to grow as we add protein? And he finds, yes. You can see here with the 20%, it's really the same graph I just showed you. It's kind of inverted, but it's the same graph, whereas more protein, more casein, leads to higher uh, promotion, the second stage. And you can see here the way that they're, the metric for promotion is this foci response. If we go a little bit closer here, you can see that less casein, less glass of milk, less foci response. So foci, this is the, it's the fancy word, right, for this precursor of clusters that grow into tumors. So although most foci do not become full-blown tumor cells, they are predictive of tumor development. And he writes this on page 54. So that's the explanation for that. Does it make sense? So again, this on and off switch. Initiation is the first experiment. Number two is it's growing and we can control that by the amount of casein. One idea seemed to be clear. Lower protein intake dramatically decreased tumor initiation on page 53. All right, this brings us to the third experiment. T. Colin Campbell then wondered, well, is it the amount of casein simply that turns it on and off. What if it was the amount of toxicity? What if we added lots more of the toxin, which I'm representing here by cigarettes because we know what that looks like. What if we had lots and lots of the toxin and a little bit of the protein? How would that affect? You know, maybe it's people who, let's just say, smoke a lot or have lots of toxicity in their body who are more affected by this casein. Maybe if you're really healthy, this doesn't matter. 
I'm, I'm kind of, uh, these are my you know, thoughts in my head that I'm just kind of trying to uh, extrapolate these ideas. But this is, this is the feeling of, of this experiment here. Like, is it the toxicity level or is it the protein level? And so he compared the two. And <laughs> this is kind of like scary, actually. Um, his finding was here on the left that with a low level of protein and a high level of toxicity, the AF there, the aflatoxin, you see actually the foci response, actually the tumor, the foci didn't cluster, didn't grow as much, right? Whereas on the right here, with just a little bit of toxicity, a little bit of seed, and a lot of bit of milk or casein, you saw tremendous growth. So it really didn't matter how big the seed was, how big the toxicity was, it still proved to be cancerous. So the experiment here showed that a higher dose of aflatoxin, and remember that's the carcinogen, and a lower protein intake resulted in lower foci, lower tumor clusters. That's the summary from the book. All right, this brings us to experiment number four, a significant finding. And in a significant finding, he says, okay, I understand that high degrees of protein have effect on cancer growth and low degrees of the, the casein, the protein, have low effects. What about in the middle, right? Like, is it just, is it just incremental? Is it even? And so we did this at all different stages, 4% of your daily protein, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 20, as you can see here. And what he found was that it was around the 10% mark that things after that would kind of exponentially explode. Check that out. So up to about 10%, things are temperate. And then around 12, 14, 20, things get crazy. So what does that mean? Let me read from the book here. Foci developed only when the animals met or exceeded the amount of protein needed to satisfy their body growth rate. That is, when the animals met and surpassed their requirements for protein, disease onset began. What that means is the body has an optimal percentage of protein it needs. And that is really a big finding. And the way I can explain this a little more simply and with an analogy that might make sense is, <laughs> have you ever overwatered a plant? Oh my God. Totally, right? <laughs> Story of my life. You know that a plant needs a certain amount of water. And if you go over, if you go too much over, it gets all soggy and overwatered, just like that. But if you don't have enough, it also dies. So plants, just like our bodies, have this optimal amount of water it needs. And for the human body, with the daily amount of your percentage of protein, we're talking about 10%. And that's a big finding from the book. Around 10% of animal protein or of protein in general is what your body needs. And after that, it gets overwatered. To break that down into something useful and usable for you, uh, you can see you know, what is 10% of animal protein? What does that look like? We're talking about roughly 46 grams for women and 56 for men. I found that on WebMD, I believe. And you can see that what that is, that all of this together is about 50 grams, somewhere in between, just to give you an idea. So that would be three ounces of meat, a small amount of meat, um, one yogurt, and two glasses of milk is roughly about all of the protein you should have. And is that how much animal protein we eat here in America each day? No. <laughs> a lot more, I'm sure, right? And this is where, where he's saying a lot of the problems come and how we treat our bodies and, and the amount we're getting. Finally, experiment number five, the big payoff. So the big payoff, I mean, up until now, we've seen that we can turn on and off the, the cancer growth with casein, right, with the animal protein. And we've also seen that there's actually an optimum level, about 10%, whereas when we get past that, things get really bad. What about using different kinds of protein? Because up till now, we've only used the casein, right, the animal protein in, in the cow milk. What if we use something like a vegetable protein? How would that react? So 
here is the fifth experiment. And you can see in this graph, this is should be somewhat familiar because we have the, the big milk and the small milk, right? The high amount of casein causing the large foci response, the large amount of uh, promotion in cancer, right? Cancer growth. And the small amount having less effect. We know that already. And here in the middle, he tested wheat protein, right? Gluten, kind of like a bread. And here at 20%, gluten versus 20% casein, you can see there's a big difference in how it affects the body's cancer growth. And that's a huge finding. It's a huge finding because if you remember the overwatering analogy with the plant, right, it's basically saying that you can't overwater your body with vegetable protein. So you can get as much vegetable protein, right, from, um, from gluten here, you could also say uh, vegetables like beans or broccoli, all different places that you can get uh, protein from. And it's not going to have that same kind of effect, the exponential growth that casein has. And that's the big finding of the China study and mostly what people are referring to when they're talking about the China study. So to recap this final and fifth experiment, does plant protein affect cancer initiation and promotion? No, it does not. It does not affect it in the same way the casein did. Reading from the book, gluten, the protein of wheat, did not produce the same results as casein, even when fed at the same 20% level. End quote, page 59. The main takeaway from all of this and what T. Colin Campbell says in the book is that nutrients from animal-based foods increases tumor development, while nutrients from the plant-based foods actually slows down and in some cases decreases the tumor development. Summarizing all this into three words, food is medicine. T. Colin Campbell looks at food as a medicine, something you can put into your body and turn on and off the onset of disease. He looks at this in his experiments with cancer, as we've just seen, and through countless other experiments in the book that other researchers have done, and he puts it all together in this China study to show the way that food is affecting not only cancer, but heart disease, osteoporosis, diabetes, and tons of other um, of the, the main things killing us these days. That's what the book is all about. I want to close this. I want to close this segment on the experiments uh, with this graphic I made here. Uh, just water in my weeds. I think this fairly summarizes food is medicine um, by thinking about the places that we are putting nutrients and the nutrients we choose to grow our body. If you're putting in lots, too much animal protein, too much uh, toxicity, all of these, right? It's going to lead to detrimental effects that's analogous to like watering the weeds in your body. Oh, and one more thing. This is a great question. And this comes from T. Colin Campbell's second book, Whole, but I wanted to throw it in here because I think it's related. The question is, Will you get cancer from smoking? Think about it. Will you, will you or I, if we smoke every day, get cancer? And the answer is maybe. <laughs> the answer is maybe because it's not a guarantee. What we're talking about here with, with smoking is probability. What we're talking about is you are more likely to get it if you smoke every day, but it's not guaranteed. And so you're playing a game of odds, right? I mean, if you go and stand out in the middle of the road every day or run across a highway every day, are you going to get hit by a car? Maybe not, but probably eventually, right? And that's what we're talking about here. With smoking, you smoke every day. You smoke three packs a day. I mean, it's not guaranteed, but you're more likely. And when we think of food as medicine, and when we think of uh, watering weeds, and when we think of all of these analogies and experiments for how we are treating our body, it's not a guarantee. And that's why there's no real like proof in science, right? We can't prove this for everyone. But we can say you are more likely, more and more likely, the more that you carry this on. So our bodies are cumulative in that way, right? It's adding up over time. It's like if you go to the gym every day, you know, one time, whatever, but you do it a few times a week, 
right, over a few years, and that's the that's the decision you're making. Are you more likely to go in the direction of being healthy or declining and not being healthy? So the book ends on page 108. So, so far, all of that has come in just the first part of the book here, about the first 108 pages. And this is, I say the book ends on page 108 because when most people talk about the China study or I agree or I disagree or uh, do you know the China study, mostly what they're talking about is the research that's in this first 100 pages. Not always, but mostly. That's the most, you know, data-rich part of the book. Um, moving forward, this big chunk in the middle of the book, this looks at how animal protein and plant protein affect not only cancer, but other diseases. And that's a really important part as well. Um, it's the same story. I'm going to kind of spoiler for you. But it goes through how it affects heart disease, how it affects obesity, how it affects diabetes, uh, autoimmune diseases, breast cancer, on and on and on. And you will find research and experiments just showing the same thing that you saw with cancer over and over again. So if you understood the bit on cancer, basically you can just apply that to this list of other diseases. And so that's a big part, a big chunk of the book here. Um, and then finally, there is quite a few pages on how to eat, so recommendations on diet. And uh, an amazing story about T. Colin Campbell's called The Dark Side, uh, history, working with the government since the 70s uh, and legislation in our country. He was there and part of all this, and he has a great story to tell. Um, but that is, I guess, just an additional context that the book is bringing towards the end. So that is the China study, and that's that's everything that I wanted to cover here. Um, but what I do want to leave with is some of this from the end. I want to compress it into just a few more lessons about how to eat and specifically now how antioxidants in plants have this additional booster to your health when you're considering what foods to eat. So let's look at that. Let's look at antioxidants right now. Plants are magic. And that's a quote from me because that's basically how I felt when I read this few pages here on antioxidants. Um, I knew antioxidants were good for me, and that's probably all I knew. I knew that they were good in maybe helping fighting cancer. That's what people say. Um, but this explanation really made it clear, and I hope that this also helps you because it was inspiring to me. So antioxidants. Uh, we know they're good for us. We know that they help fight cancer. But what exactly do they do and where do they come from? So antioxidants, those are the colors in fruits and vegetables. Literally, the colors that you see are the antioxidants. And you absorb those. So from the book here, we absorb the antioxidant power from plants and thereby gain added protection from certain diseases. So that's what they do. Also, a really cool story about how they work. If you think about, because um, antioxidant just sounds like this crazy word, but if you break it down, oxidant, like oxidate, right? It's something you've seen before. If you've ever seen an apple get brown, think about that. How does it work? You take a bite out of an apple, you let it sit there, and it gets brown. So that's a process of oxidation. Basically, the oxygen is... Um, making it brown, right? It's making it kind of uh, wilt or not, not as good, right? And that's basically the way we could talk about antioxidants. You're anti, you are stopping that aging process, right? Right, right before your eyes. And the same thing is true for your body. So how exactly do antioxidants protect you from cancer? Well, to understand that, you need to understand the concept of free radicals. Another word which I had heard a bit here and there, but maybe didn't understand what it meant. So this is from the book. To a great extent, free radicals are responsible for aging and human decay, just like the apple. Our bodies produce these free radicals when we are exposed to the sun's rays, improper nutrition, and industrial pollutants. So in short, free radicals are nasty. I wrote that last little bit. I added that in there. So plants make antioxidants. They only come from plants fruits and vegetables, right? And by eating plants, you absorb these antioxidants. So what you're doing is absorbing protection from these free radicals. So that's how antioxidants work. And that's just a little, little bit that I learned here from the China study that I wanted to share with you. Now, on to how to eat. So how does the China study recommend you eat? Now, I'm going to keep this video pretty short and put some notes and links down below. But I want to solidify the point here of what we're talking about. What we're talking about, really here on page 122, it sums it up. The past 50 years have truly been a celebration of chemicals and technology, as opposed to diet and prevention. So diet and prevention, we're looking at bringing food into our bodies as a way to prevent 
us ever getting to that third stage of crazy out of control cancer, right? And what he's saying is food is medicine. We're looking at food as a type of medicine we can put in our bodies. And this is where things get subjective, right? Because a lot of us eat based on how things taste, right? This kind of like a, a sentimental like, oh yeah, it reminds me of something or it feels good um, at the moment of the taste. But if we if we kind of put that aside for a second, I'm not saying that taste isn't important. It is super important, right? But just to kind of reframe it, if only for a second, to think of food as a type of medicine. And by having greens and, and reds of, of strawberries and, and plants and putting them into your body and looking at the ways that they can restore and rebuild uh, and protect you from disease. So it's just reframing and considering that when we choose the food that we choose. So in one sentence, eat a whole food, plant-based diet while minimizing the consumption of refined foods, added salt, and added fats. Three steps, eat plants, eat less animal proteins, and avoid processed foods. And that's it. And you can, you can check out the slide for a second. You can pause if you want. There'll be some notes down below. And let's continue to a few, uh, a few ways that we're going to finish this out with a challenge that I have for you and a fun clip from a movie that I think is going to help stick this in your head. Uh, I want to watch that together. So before we close out, I want to show you a clip from a movie that I really like. This is called Idiocracy. Maybe you've seen it. And the basic premise of the movie is that we have Luke Wilson here, and he's in the future, right, like many years from now. And in the future, there's a lot of little strange quirks about the future. But one in particular is that they are watering their plants basically with Gatorade, OK? So why? Because it has electrolytes. In the movie, the Gatorade is called Brondo. So that, that's the thing that they're going to refer to. And we're going to watch this in a second. But they're, referring, they're, they're watering and drinking everything everything, no water, but just this Brondo because it has electrolytes. Let's take a look at the video and I'll, we'll talk about it afterwards. So check this out. The last time, I'm pretty sure what's killing the crops is this Brondo stuff. The Brondo's got what plants crave. It's got electrolytes. So wait a minute. What you're saying is that you want us to put water on the crops? Yes. Water. Like out the toilet? Well, I mean, it doesn't have to be out of the toilet, but, but yeah, that's the idea. But Brondo's got what plants crave. It's got electrolytes. Okay, look, the plants aren't growing, so I'm pretty sure that the Brondo's not working. Now, I'm no botanist, but I do know that if you put water on plants, they grow. Oh, well, I've never seen no plants grow out of no toilet. Hey, that's good. You sure you ain't the smartest guy in the world? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, look, you want to solve this problem. I want to get my pardon, so why don't we just try it, okay? And not worry about what plants crave. Brando's got what plants crave. Yeah, it's got electrolytes. What are electrolytes? Do you even know? It's what they use to make Brando. Yeah, but why do they use them to make Brando? Because Brando's got electrolytes. So this movie never really resonated with me quite the same way as after reading the China study. And I hope that's the analogy to you. Um, maybe you feel that. Maybe you feel that a little bit. When we talk about protein and when we talk about our health, uh, these things that we're getting from all these different media sources and all these different people and all these different uh, ideas out there, it's really whole, hard to get this kind of holistic view of how our bodies are operating and how disease is, is working within our bodies. And that's really what the China study is, is getting at. And he talks a lot at the end about um, this idea of scientific reductionism. And I'm not going to go into that right now, but the, the simple, I just the simple idea of it is just looking at one piece of thing, like in this film, you know, looking at the electrolytes from Brondo and just saying like, well, that's what they're do. They're good for you. Right. But not maybe looking at the fact that the plants that the electrolytes are also killing the plants, right? So we tend to look at things in our body as like, hey, this thing, you know, um, milk is really good for you. It's good because you have calcium. But we're failing to look at the fact that, well, milk also has this animal protein that is affecting other parts of your body uh, in a negative way, as we've seen. So looking at the holistic implications of of uh, food, right? And that's, again, every time you see, just to me, the 11 o'clock news, and it's like, today, oils are good for you. Tomorrow, oils are bad for you. And that, to me, is, is what we're hitting on here. So as soon as I finished the book, The China Study, I gave this a try for 30 days, eating strictly on the diet. And let me just stop there and say, 
I am not a health nut. I drink beer on the weekends. I like cookies. I like to go out to eat and have whatever I want. Um, but that doesn't mean. I mean, I'm concerned. You know, I'm concerned about how how I eat and my health. So it doesn't mean that I don't want to try to eat better. You know, and it doesn't mean that I don't want to learn about how food can affect me for the best. So that's where I'm coming from. I basically want to find and learn the best ways that I can build habits in my life. To me, building habits is a, is a really important thing. And for me, having the empowerment to know, you know, this is good for me and this is bad and making that kind of calculated risk, right? I mean, it's like in, here in New York City, I see people uh, running to yoga and, and smoking cigarettes, right? Like there's contradictions in all of our lives and who am I to judge. I mean, who cares, right? But all I can really do is just bring you this information um, and let you choose for yourself. And so I think the best way to to at least like apply it to your life is to give it like 30 days. You know what I mean? Because then you're giving it a fair shot. And here's what here's what will happen in that 30 days. What you'll find is you'll discover new foods, right? So so being part of that challenge, you're going to have to go a little outside your comfort zone and look a little further on the menu, right? Or look a little deeper into the grocery store for some chard or for some greens and different colors, right? So it will open your eyes to new foods, which is great. You'll also start to feel better. That's going to start to happen. And that's a great thing too, to to listen to your body, okay? Um, So often we eat foods and, you know, again, taste is the number one thing that we value foods on. But start to listen to your body. And you're going to find that after eating the foods and noticing it, you're going to start to feel better. Third thing, I think you're going to find it's easier than you thought. And that was what was pretty shocking for me because in my mind it was like, wow, you know, if I can't eat uh, any animal products, what am I going to eat? There's going to be no options. I'm going to starve. I'm going to hate myself. And actually part of that is maybe true for the first few days or week, uh, you know, having to have conversations with with friends. Like this is going to be hard, right? Um, But it gets easier. By the end of the 30 days, you're going to find your routine. You're going to find where to go. You're going to find how to tell that story. And that's why I think it's so important that you try this. Um, It's like, to me, it's like learning how to dance. Just follow me here. Um, But if we were going to, if this was a dance class and we just kind of talked about it, you know, you'd walk home and come back and you wouldn't actually know how to dance. But you kind of have to do it. You know, you have to like feel the way it feels and and your body reacts. And that's the same way with learning about the China study, right? Because, you know, you can sit here and absorb this and go, oh, yeah, that that's crazy interesting. Oh, wow. But if you just go on about your day and you don't actually like feel it and apply it, um, you're not going to have that response where the information sticks and where you get any visible effects or, or, or physical effects. So so that's my promise. Um, that's T. Colin Campbell's promise. And I would love to see uh, any results or any questions or um, anything, how that goes. Put, put any comments down below. Um, you could reach out at any time. I'd love to hear it. And, um, and one other thing I'll just add, this is a final thing. Uh, on the journey, this doesn't mean to only eat plants. Like it doesn't mean only plants. You still want to have grains. You still want to have other supplements in your diet. So look down below for some tips on how to eat. And also note that when you're eating on the China study diet, it's going to be, um, you're going to need to consume more food because there's going to be, you're going to need more calories. So you'll find that, you know, having this much oil or, or this much meat might be, it might be equal to like this much plants, for example. So again, look down below. I'll have some notes down there. Um, but you will need to eat more plants to feel full. And that's a normal thing uh, that is that is kind of hard for people in the beginning. So enough from me. Uh, super glad to have this you and me together. And if you have any questions, I will try my best. And uh, thank you for listening. I will see you in the future. All right. Take care. Bye.